Yep, come on up. <laughs> whatever, whatever makes you happy. All right, thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, my name is Sam Ebb. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. Uh, and I have the pleasure of introducing our next CA talk, um, which is Firewall Protecting Sports Analytics, uh, Sports Data Through the Law. Uh, and our two speakers, uh, Professor Mike McCann and Professor Rob Ford from the University of uh, New Hampshire. Great, thank you. Thanks, Sam. Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you to Sam for uh, helping to organize this event. It's it, obviously every year this is one of the best events around, and I know both Roger and I are very appreciative to be part of it, and we also thank you all for coming here to hear us talk today. Today's discussion is going to be about, as Sam mentioned, issues of security in analytics, and particularly in relationship to teams, how they develop information and then try to protect it. Uh, my colleague Roger Ford is writing a chapter related to this topic in a book that I'm the editor-in-chief of, the Oxford University Press Handbook on American Sports Law, will be coming out next fall. I hope you all pick it up, and uh, Roger's chapter will be, again be related to this, so he'll have some important insights. I think you're all familiar with the role of analytics, and we're not going to spend time talking about that. But what we will spend time talking about is that as teams have gotten much better at developing analytics and developing related data, the temptation to try to get that data and try to get the formulas and the related information goes up. It's particularly given that more and more teams are making analytics a key part of their business practice and to give them a competitive advantage. And there's, of course, a trade-off between usability and security. We know that analytics now pervades pretty much every aspect of a sports team. The most obvious is in the context of player development and in player evaluation, but less obviously it comes up in tickets, it comes up in broadcasting rights, so it pervades all aspects of an organization, and yet we know that that information is invaluable. And we know that it's difficult to protect. We know that not only do opposing teams want it, but gamblers want it, hackers want it. This was certainly apparent in the data breach involving the Houston Astros and the St. Louis Cardinals, a breach that led to somebody pleading guilty to federal criminal charges. Uh, we think that this is a warning sign for teams a warning sign for players even, who are impacted by evaluation of their ability. And in turn, agents. Agents play a key role here. If you're an agent and you represent a player who has been potentially victimized by a data breach, you may have a role as well, an important role. And what today we're gonna to talk about is how teams can respond to this growing threat, this threat that's really asymmetrical in that it's coming at teams in different directions. We will offer five solutions. Let me try to get the, well, the we've already talked about. Here are the five solutions that we'll talk about in turn. One involves league rules and norms. So this is really about the capacity of a professional sports league and its teams to negotiate and apply rules that can try to mitigate the risk of data hacking. We'll then look at non-disclosure and non-compete agreements. These refer to employment clauses that teams can utilize in negotiating contracts with prospective employees. And also, in turn, whether or not an agent to somebody who works for a team may want to be sensitive to that issue because it can impact the capacity of that employee to go on to different employment later on. We'll then look at trade secrecy law, which is a growing area of law in sports, particularly given that much of it relates to older laws that are now being applied in the digital era. Then we'll look at criminal law. Criminal law is not obvious. Criminal law, we don't talk about a lot in sports. I mean, I, I talk a lot about it because I, I also write about criminal law issues in sports. But in this context, it's not as obvious. And yet, it isn't just somebody being charged when we think about criminal law. That's the most obvious layer of it. It's also the ability of somebody being a whistleblower, temptations of employees to talk to law enforcement. That can threaten teams. And then lastly, we'll look at information security practical steps that teams can utilize to, again, mitigate risk. We're now going to begin with league norms and rules. So this is about leagues having, in some ways, unlimited power to govern the relationship between teams and staff. Now, that's very different 
from between teams and players. We know that the relationship between teams and players is born through a collective bargaining agreement where there are two units, there's management and labor that negotiate rules that impact hours, working conditions, and other wages issues. Yet with employees of teams, it's a different story. Employees work directly for teams. They don't work for leagues. They don't work for the players. Yet leagues, and as they've done clearly, have created rules that limit the relationship between teams and employees. So with that in mind, we know that leagues have created policies to prevent cheating. Now the word cheating, of course, is sort of an open-ended word. What counts as cheating? What counts as being strategic? We're not going to have that discussion today, but commissioners have the power to protect the integrity of the league in ways that are certainly controversial, as we know over the last year or so. That phrase has attracted a great deal of controversy. But the point is that it goes to the power of teams to work with leagues on creating rules that can prevent data security. So what do I mean? This is the hacking into the Houston Astros is going to present a major challenge for Major League Baseball. What is an appropriate punishment for the St. Louis Cardinals? Should the organization be held responsible for the acts of one employee? Should the leader of the organization be held responsible? What would be the appropriate remedy? Is it fining a team? Is it taking away draft picks? We know that those remedies have been used in other leagues. Leagues are going to have to be consistent about this. I mean, look at Deflategate. Right? The, the consistency of punishment has been a major source of a federal litigation that could go into next year. So leagues have to be very cautious and careful in creating policies that will lead to consistency in punishment. Rules can, of course, deter spying and can lead to uh, policies that create incentives to not spy on other teams, but it's hard to enforce. Leagues are very good at regulating conduct that relates to the games themselves, or regulating conduct that goes to contractual matters. You know, a team that is accused of spying on another team on the field, that can be dealt with by a league. A league that addresses issues of contract tampering, again, that's fairly transparent. Data security, perhaps not as much. And I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Roger, to talk about issues of non-disclosure agreements and non-compete agreements. Thanks, Mike. So as we know from a lot of other industries, one avenue that companies will use to prevent information from migrating to, from one company to another is to prevent it from going with an employee who leaves the company and goes to a competitor. And so non-disclosures and non-competes are two ways of doing so if you have, for instance, an analytics staff that knows a bunch of your team's secrets or a bunch of your team's valuable information, the easiest way for another team to get access to that information is simply to hire that person. And so if from the beginning you make that contractually harder, then that can help protect your secrets. But it's going to be complicated because it turns out that a lot of states won't let you do that. So I want to break down these two kinds of agreements. Um, Non-disclosure agreements are agreements that say an employee agrees not to disclose confidential information, and obviously that's something every team should have in place with every employee. Uh, then it depends on what you mean by confidential information, but at the very least, if an employee does disclose that information, then you would have some sort of remedy, maybe against the employee, maybe against the team that received that information. And those agreements are broadly enforceable. Uh, and so as a standard policy, you should probably have in place uh, to, make to ask employees to sign that kind of agreement when they become an employee. The problem with these agreements is that that disclosure is hard to detect. So a lot of the kinds of information we're trying to protect are things that another team could obtain from someone in your organization or could be Is this better? OK. Um, and so a non-disclosure agreement then can't solve all of your problems, because you may never know whether someone disclosed in the first place or not. And so one thing that a lot of companies have moved to instead is a non-compete, to say, 
if you're going to work for our company, you can't then move to a competitor, or you can't move to a competitor for a certain period of time. And this makes it a lot easier to prevent and to detect data breaches, because you can see when someone moves to a competitor in a way that you can't see if they're handing over information without telling you. Um, and so, in a lot of industries, this has become a standard way to protect secret information. The problem is that movements between teams are very common and probably necessary for the league. So, teams are small organizations. There's not necessarily enough room for advancement within the league. Um, and so, it may be necessary for an employee to move to a competitor to hit the next step in their career. And it may be good for the league as a whole to have that kind of flow of information between teams because there's this collective interest in learning from each other. And so movement may actually be valuable to the teams. So this is not a perfect solution to this problem. You can't just say to every employee, um, you have to sign a non-compete agreement. There are also problems with uh, leagues may block this, unions may block this, and in some states, state law will block this. So in California, for instance, non-compete agreements are just uh, illegal in most circumstances. So these are things that a team needs to think through. Are there positions within the organization where we want this kind of agreement, where it would be valuable? Um, maybe there are ways to do it where instead of saying you can't move to a competitor, if you're going to move to a competitor, you have to wait a certain period, and maybe we'll pay you for that period, so you have to take a year off or something like that, so the information becomes stale and less valuable. Um, but there are things that may be valuable for certain employees and you want to think through. Then the next answer a team might look to is trade secrecy. So trade secrecy is an area of intellectual property law where the law protects information that is valuable because of its secrecy. And so this can include things like marketing strategies, things like how a secret manufacturing process works, but it can also include all sorts of things that would be valuable to a team. Uh, the sorts of data and the sorts of insights that an analytics staff would, would come to are precisely the kind of thing that are economically valuable because other teams don't know them. And so under the law of trade secrecy, then they're protected. And that means what, what, what that means is that another team can't misappropriate that information without being liable to the first team. So for instance, thinking back to the Astros Cardinals data breach, the Astros could have a, val a valid claim against the Cardinals for misappropriating the data that the Cardinals uh, got access to. And so they could, in theory, file a lawsuit and collect damages from the Cardinals for whatever they suffered due to that breach. This is a little impractical to do, though, because leagues have a collective interest in handling disputes internally. Leagues have an interest in not having this sort of thing be public, not having it be in court, not having someone testify um, on exactly what was so valuable about that information. And so, typically, a league will have, will have some sort of internal dispute resolution mechanism uh, that would substitute for this. And that may or may not be an adequate deterrent. Um, there's also a reputational concern there, where you wouldn't want um, sort of all of your dirty underwear exposed to the public. And so, there's a cost-benefit analysis that needs to be done before figuring out whether to rely on trade secrecy. And so, that's going to be one constraint preventing someone from using trade secrecy law. Another is that when you don't have another team that's getting the information, but if you have a hacker or a gambler or someone like that, you may not be able to find the person who hacked into your website or hacked into your server. And so, you know, in the, in the Astros Cardinals case, the information that was leaked to Deadspin came from the Cardinals, we think, but Someone else who got access to that information, information could just have easily leaked it to someone on the internet or posted it on Pastebin or something like that. And so in that case, there would be no trade secret remedy because you couldn't even find the person who did it. Um, so trade secrets, while a useful thing to keep in mind, particularly for dealings with other teams, don't end up solving this problem entirely. 
Um, so next we're going to turn to criminal law, and Mike is going to talk about that. So criminal law is another potential recourse for a team that feels as if its data has been hacked or otherwise compromised. Criminal law, of course, doesn't provide a remedy to the actual victim. Criminal law is about trying to balance the harm, the social harm that's been breached against a state or the federal government, depending upon what kind of law is implicated. So when someone is obviously the victim of a crime, a prosecution of the person who inflicted the crime doesn't benefit the person who's actually hurt. The person who did the crime could potentially go to prison, but that doesn't actually restore the balance. That's why we have a series of civil laws that are designed to do that. Nonetheless, a team, such as a team that's been victimized, can go to the FBI, can alert the FBI that a potential data breach has occurred. There is a federal law called the Con Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which prevents and imposes up to a five-year prison sentence for each count of an intentional invasion of someone else's computer without that person's permission. Now, this is a controversial law that, as some of you may remember, Aaron Schwartz, who was a young man who uh, committed suicide, this was the, one of the laws that was used to go after him after he had posted material. Uh, this is a controversial law that some people believe it's overused, that it's used in a way that infringes upon freedom of speech, Nonetheless, it's a really scary law, because it's scary in that if you are accused of it, we're talking five years for every invasion that you made into another person's computer. So often, a person charged with this is looking at multiple counts. And often, the person will strike a plea deal where they're still serving some prison time. So a very scary law that a team wants to be careful about before it proceeds, particularly if it looks like the team's own security was invaded because of not being good at protecting it. And this gets at the issue of once you go to law enforcement, you no longer control the story, right? And once you go over to law enforcement, they're going to be investigating. They are going to be taking depositions. A team may have some caution going down that path because other things can surface when law enforcement starts investigating. So I would, I think both Roger and I agree, this is a source of law that is, is taken with a cautionary tale. Because while certainly a team doesn't want to be hacked, a team doesn't want to be exposed for some of its information, it also doesn't want to be put in a position where it is cooperating with the government in an investigation that it no longer is calling the shots. There's also issues of potential publicity, where a team that is cooperating with the government, there can be leaks to the media when there's an investigation. A team may not want that. Also, we don't know how a league would respond to a team beginning to cooperate with law enforcement. Does a, a top, you know, does a professional sports organization want one of its teams to be having a sidebar conversation with the government? My instinct is probably not. I would imagine that the league would want that coordinated. But it is a source of law. Again, it's a scary law that if a team feels as if it's been violated in terms of its data, it can contact, but it doesn't restore the balance. And I, and I want to make that uh, very clear. And now I'm going to turn it back to Roger for information security. Okay, so if none of these other tools are going to be adequate, then you kind of have to go with the ultimate unilateral solution, which is to use computer security, to use information security to prevent these problems from arising in the first place. Uh, there's a saying in the computer security world that there are two kinds of companies or two kinds of organizations, uh, those who have been hacked and had their data um, stolen, and those who don't yet know that they've had their data stolen. And so, at this point, investing in good electronic security, investing in good information security, is really a critical must-do must uh, piece of your overall organization. This takes money. This takes buy-in from the entire organization, from the top down. Uh, and, and it's going to, you know, use up a significant percent of the organization's overall attention and time and, and investment. But the downside is that all of your information is exposed to the world on dead spin or worse. Um, and so coming up with a strategy to protect your information is, is becoming increasingly important. Uh, there are a lot of ways to do this. Um, you can hire an in-house person 
who manages your security operations. So somebody like a chief information security officer or a chief privacy officer who has the authority to instill those kinds of things throughout the organization. There are also a lot of consultants who do this work who will come in and spend some time with the team and uh, figure out what sorts of, of firewalls, what sorts of encryption and security need to be done within the team. Uh, and there, there are a lot of companies that are developing off-the-shelf products that are designed to make this easier, designed to uh, provide a, a standard solution that will work across a lot of different types of organizations. And I don't have um, a lot to say about which option is best, except that I would say to the extent that you make certain that there's buy-in within, the, within the entire organization, these things are more likely to succeed. And so that then bringing in an in-house person might be the best way to go. Um, this also means it's a long-term cultural commitment. It is a commitment from every part of the organization not to carelessly or intentionally leave data exposed to the world. So uh, this means things like strong encryption on your server, uh, individual passwords that are changed fairly regularly, uh, where access controls can be revoked if someone leaves the team. It means um, being careful about access outside of the organization. We, you have to allow that to some degree because people travel and will need access to this information when they're, when they're traveling, but you don't want to make it so anyone who goes to the website and has the right username and password can just get information. You want to use two-factor authentication and things like that. And then you want to build a culture where every single member of the organization understands that this is a necessary thing to do. And that's through training and that's through um, you know, authority to the people who do it to say, no, we have to do this differently. Uh, and, and the goal of all of this is that hopefully then you head off these problems before they happen. You, you know, no one is able to get access to your database and so it won't be exposed to the world through Deadspin. Okay, so that's the five solutions that teams have avail available to them. At the end, I, I wanna go through a, a couple of quick tips on how to use this stuff in a practical manner. And so I have tips on the law, tips on the technology, and tips on the culture. So on the law side, each of these legal tools we've mentioned, trade secrecy, um, non-disclosure agreements, and non-compete agreements, and, and criminal law, is more effective if you've thought about them in advance. So for trade secrecy, you're only protected by law if you've taken adequate steps to protect your information, which means that you have policies in place, means you have encryption systems in place and access logs, and things like that where you can say to a court later on, no, we have taken enough steps, therefore we are protected by the law. Uh, in terms of NDAs and non-competes, it's something you want to think through very carefully, probably get legal advice from someone who's familiar with the law in your state. But it's something where if you think about what are the employees who have access to our most valuable information, what are the potential risks there, the threat models there, uh, and then tailoring a, an NDA or a non-compete to those particular threat models and those particular employees, um, then you set yourself up well for if something happens or they want to move on or something like that. On the technology side, the key here is to take security seriously. And so that requires a lot of training. It requires constant updating because security is not something where once you put it into place, it works from then on. It's something where new exploits will be discovered, new bugs in websites will be discovered or in servers. And so you have to make certain that you're every day, every week, every month, making certain that you still have strong security in place. And thinking about what the different pieces of your organization are and who needs access to what information is key. Because it, it's sometimes the case that you see one server with everything that everyone has access to. But that means that there are a lot of people who, are, who have access to private information they don't need to do their job, and that your exposed surface area to a data breach is far higher. And so thinking through that at the beginning is really valuable. And then finally, cultural tips. 
develop a culture of secrecy and a culture of security with no exceptions, no exemptions. There's no one who can say, oh, I'm not going to worry about that right now. I need to worry about something else. Um, the really successful organizations are the ones that develop a culture where every employee is empowered to say something, to point out problems. This is, the warriors are famous for this. You know, a special assistant was the one who pointed out um, that they should start Andre Iguodala in the finals, and it worked. Um, and so, you know, if everyone from, you know, the CEO or general manager on down to an intern can point out a security flaw, then that can help you head off a problem before it comes back to bite you. Uh, and part of this is having someone in charge of this with actual authority. So there are a lot of studies about how organizations that protect, uh, that deal with private information protect that information or not. And what they find is that when you have someone whose job is to focus on that, who is in the room for the important meetings and has authority to say no to things, that's when it works best. It's when you have that person with real authority that you head off the problems before they start. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much. We have some time for, for questions, and we hope this has been helpful. Yeah, so the question was, if someone, if a data scientist creates something outside of a company and then brings it into the company, um, whose intellectual property is that and is it covered by a non-disclosure agreement or maybe a non-compete agreement? The answer to that is that it's really going to vary depending on the contract you have with the employee. So um, this is something you want to be careful about when you're negotiating with the employee. Some contracts will have a term that says something like, any intellectual property that relates to the area of employment or the, the area of the industry developed while you're an employee is automatically intellectual property of the employer. Um, and that's very common. It's something that can be negotiated. An employee might balk at that. Um, but it's something that um, if you think about in advance, you run out, you don't have problems with. The other scenario is someone who invents something and then later becomes an employee. Typically, if they bring it with them in that circumstance, it would still be their intellectual property unless they've come to some agreement to sell it or something like that. Does that sound right? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. You mentioned how um, like teams or, or organizations or leagues are sort of incented to keep things in house. And um, is there something about the rules and exclusion law that would apply to this? Or is there anything from the criminal law? Well, let me take collusion, that part repeat, of the question. Repeat the question. Sure. So the question is about when a league and its teams choose not to turn over information to law enforcement, do they have some kind of duty to either the government or perhaps to other impacted actors like players to cooperate in a way that's transparent? The, the part of the question on collusion, let me just take that one part, that one first. The collective bargaining agreement of every league, every league is going to have a CBA with the union that will have clauses on collusion. And the collusion clauses will say in so many words that no two, two or more teams can conspire in a way that deprives players of a collectively bargained right. So there, there is the potential that that kind of conversation could, at least in theory, deprive a player of a, a collectively bargained right. Let me try to get this back. I think they switched us uh, to okay. the video. Well, that's OK. Yeah. Do you want to take the part of? the other part of collusion on the, with the government? What yeah, so, so when you have multiple teams who, who are cooperating with each, with each other in a league, um, it's going to bring up an antitrust concern. And I think that it's very likely, I don't know of a case on this, but it's very likely that a court would say an internal dispute resolution mechanism that doesn't really affect the outside world um, wouldn't present strong antitrust concerns. It would be sort of like binding arbitration or a mediator or something like that. Uh, 
then if, if you had teams that decided I, I'm not interested in cooperating with law enforcement, you can do that up to a certain level. At a certain point, it becomes obstruction of justice. And so, um, you know, you, you, there are minimum levels of cooperation that are, that are required, but um, a team could probably get away with saying, we're gonna help you out to the minimum we need to, but we're not going to build the case against our employee for you. You know, we're gonna handle this internally. And law enforcement would probably respect that and back off. So we have time for one question. Yep, thank you. Um, so we know that trade secret law is mostly code-based, and Lee talked to the developer company Quarter, who thinks that federal trade secret act could help it impact if it comes to what it's supposed to be. I'll let you take that. So Repeat the question. Okay. Yeah, so the question is Great about question. Uh, trade secrets as state law. Trade secret is mostly state law in the United States. Um, there is a proposed federal trade secrets act, and the question is whether uh, teams and leagues would be helped out if that became law or if, if it became a federal doctrine. Um, I think that it, it's absolutely the case that if we had a single uniform national trade secret law, uh, it might make it a little easier to protect your secrets. But for the most part, um, although it is state law, there's enough similarity and enough commonality from state to state that probably every, every team can, can safely rely on state law for, to protect trade secrets. Uh, there's also federal criminal penalties that protect theft of trade secrets that are, that are nationalized. And so those are sort of a helpful um, last resort. I think we're out of time. We're Thank out of time. You Thank much. you very much. Thank you.